Welcome back. This is session two. This one, this time we'll be talking about the symptoms and causes of anxiety and depression. Um, couple housekeeping things. First of all, please, I didn't tell this in the first session, but I wanted to remind you that please to keep track of any of your time that you spend watching any of these videos um, or doing any kind of preparing for this in any way, because we'll put that in your time card. So I'll teach you how to do that when we get together in person, but just or for right now, just keep track of your time, the time you spent doing the pretest, the survey that we did, and any time you spend watching these videos. Um, I will send you electronic copy, but I also have a paper copy that covers every single thing we're um, talking about in here. So you don't have to feel like you have to take notes or commit anything to memory. We have a really nice paper copy of the whole curriculum that will be for you to keep that covers every single one of these topics and even gives a little bit more information about them. So just wanted to let you know that that will be available to you as well. Okay, Ani. Yeah, so like um, she said, we're gonna be talking a little bit of, about symptoms and causes of anxiety and depression. Um, so this is just to help um, A, you be able to recognize um, when someone might be experiencing anxiety and depression and to feel like you have a pretty good handle on how to explain it to them um, and to recognize, you know, what might be some triggers and what's um, what might be causing it. Um, so to start, the number, or I guess just the first thing we really want to communicate is that anxiety and depression is an illness. So just like heart disease, just like diabetes, anxiety and depression is a real illness. And so with it being a real illness, it has real and specific symptoms associated with it. Um, these symptoms have specific causes and there are specific treatments available. So um, one analogy that we really like to use um, is relating it to diabetes. A lot of people are really familiar with diabetes. And so um, it can really help people to see anxiety and depression as a real illness when we make this connection. Um, so just like with diabetes, um, anxiety and depression is often a result of an imbalance in the brain. So if you think, if we think about diabetes, you either um, have too much blood sugar, or too low blood sugar. And if you have, if you're experiencing one of those two things, um, you're going to be having symptoms with it. So for example, if you have low blood sugar, you're probably going to feel dizzy, maybe a little tired. You might even pass out if it's really severe. Um, and in order to manage your diabetes, you um, will either be making some um, lifestyle changes. So maybe exercise, controlling your diet to manage it. Um, for some people with more extreme cases, they might need things like insulin or a medication like metformin or something. Um, sometimes people can be on medication for a short time. And with those lifestyle changes, they can wean off the medication. And then there's other people who are on insulin or um, pill medication for their entire life. Um, so diabetes, imbalance of your blood sugar, it causes symptoms when it's when it's not right. And there's different treatments and ways to manage it. Um, same thing with anxiety and depression. So there's an imbalance in your brain chemicals. And if you have this imbalance, it can cause symptoms, um, which we're going to talk about in just a second, all those different kinds of symptoms you might experience. And there's treatments available. Um, so we um, will be talking about some, you know, coping strategies and self-care methods um, that are kind of more lifestyle changes. And then we'll also be covering some more advanced treatments. So um, whether that's one-on-one -on -one counseling or medication um, or that kind of thing, and maybe someone needs medication for just a short time and maybe for a longer time. And we're going to get into that more um, but the key thing here is to recognize that, um, you know, we often share and talk about our physical things, our physical diseases, and we don't consider anxiety and depression to be on that same level. Um, but we really want to encourage people to understand that anxiety and depression needs to be um, like managed and recognized just like other diseases are. Um, that's kind of one of our goals here. So along with that, we need to know what anxiety and depression is not. It is not a character issue, like someone with anxiety and depression is not lazy. They're not just irritable. They're not bad parents. So anxiety and depression is not a character issue. 
anxiety and depression is not a sign of weakness. So I remember in the men's focus group that men talked about this a lot, that sometimes it's hard to come forward and tell someone if they're struggling with depression or anxiety, because to them, it felt like a sign of weakness. And sometimes I feel like men have this real need to be strong and to have everything together. And so this can be a barrier, but it's not a sign of weakness. Um, so that is a good thing to remember about what it is not is. And it's not necessarily something you can just snap out of. So that's the third thing it is not. And unfortunately, um, sometimes we treat this this way. And this can be a stigma that goes with anxiety, depression, where someone can feel like, you know, well, you're feeling sad this morning, just snap out of it. You know, you can just snap out of it. It's not something you can always snap out of. Now, the analogy with the diabetes is incredibly valuable. And we encourage you to use that when you feel like someone is feeling discouraged about having anxiety and depression, they may share this with you that I don't understand why I can't just snap out of this depression. I don't understand why I can't just always, you know, get rid of my anxiety. I mean, reminding them that, you know, you can't just snap out of diabetes. You can't. And if you are a diabetic, it doesn't mean you're weak. It has nothing to do with it. It's not a sign of weakness. These are real illnesses with real symptoms, but they have real treatments and encouraging them that if someone is struggling with anxiety or depression, there is treatment available and there's things we can do. And I would say your space, your role as an ambassador is obviously we want to prevent anxiety and depression in people as much as possible or help people manage small bouts of it, you know, in a way where they can use their own lifestyle changes. So their own coping strategies, their own techniques or practicing self-care. That's really the area that we lean into as this ambassador program. However, we know that sometimes that is not enough in certain situations. And so we're going to equip you and prepare you what to do if that is the case. Maybe someone is trying all the self-care, lifestyle modifications, and still cannot um, get on top of it. Well, then they might need a little bit more involved sort of treatment. And that's not your role to go into that area, but it is your role to help them connect them. Maybe this is where they can go. This is a referral you can make, you know, encouraging them to talk to their provider about it. Those are all really important steps for that next stage. But we really work in the space of trying to help people before that happens. Or even if they are on treatment, helping them with additional self-care coping strategies they can use in their everyday life to prevent this or manage it in their life. And just to add to that, um, part of reducing stigma is normalizing getting help or seeing your provider for help. So again, using an analogy, we'll say for heart disease, um, you know, if you had high blood pressure, if you were having strange rhythms or um, chest pain or, you know, swelling, if you were having these heart disease symptoms, um, you know, a lot of times people would go to their doctor and, and want to receive help to manage it and want to be checked out. And so in the same way, if you're having these symptoms um, and you're, you're kind of unable to manage it yourself, it's a good idea to go see your provider. And that's, um, you know, an, an important part of taking care of your health. Your mental health is just as important to take care of and seek help for as your physical health. So anything else on that? Okay. So now we're going to just touch on briefly symptoms of anxiety and depression. So a lot of times when we think of symptoms, we think our, our first thoughts go to um, ones related to our mood. Um, so things like feeling sad or hopeless. These are absolutely symptoms, but it's a little more complex than that. So we kind of have these four categories that we recognize that we see symptoms of anxiety and depression. So um, absolutely the way we feel, those feelings, those moods. Um, also the way we act, um, the way we think, and then the way our bodies react. So I'll just go through and give a few examples of each of these for depression and anxiety. Um, these are not things that you have to remember. It's just to help you get a feel for all the different ways anxiety and depression can present. Um, and just to kind of be clued in a little bit of if someone's sharing something, um, just to consider that maybe that might be a different expression of something else. Um, or anxiety and depression might be um, kind of the root of it. So for feelings, um, 
feeling symptoms um, associated with depression would be angry, sad, bitter, hopeless, helpless, worthless, don't care about things. For anxiety, it might be impatient, uneasy, tense, fearful, frustrated, alarmed, jittery, um, numb. So that's kind of some feeling associated symptoms. Um, in terms of the actions, um, these can also be kind of at times unhealthy coping actions. So it could be drug or alcohol use, uh, poor personal hygiene, isolating from others, underachievement, maybe being aggressive. That was one thing that came up in the focus groups was um, kind of lashing out, getting into fights. Um, and really um, the root of that was more kind of dealing with some anxiety and depression. Um, the next one would be the way we think. Um, this one is, uh, this one can be really hard to see, uh, but is really, I think very prevalent and an important one to consider and recognize. So for depression, this might be confusion, hard to concentrate, hard to make decisions, loss of motivation, self-blame, or even self-harm thoughts. And then with anxiety, um, forgetfulness, preoccupied, errors in judgment, er sorry, errors in judgment, um, reduced creativity, or even nightmares. Um, so yeah, that inability to focus, racing thoughts, some of those kind of things. And then one that I always find really interesting is we can have these physical um, symptoms in our bodies um, that are actually caused by anxiety and depression. Um, so for depression, it can be um, physical pain we feel, headaches, stomach problems, nausea, um, sleep problems. So it can either be sleeping too much, sleeping too little. So it can get confusing. It can be both extremes we're seeing. Um, again, eating too much or having no appetite, not eating um, for anxiety. Again, that racing heart, feeling faint, blood pressure. You might feel short of breath, um, nausea, feeling weak, sweating, flushed face. So sometimes in those panic attack situations, you might've seen someone kind of hyperventilating, sweating. Um, so just important to see all these different ways it can be presented. I think one thing interesting is that anxiety can have a very similar presentation as a heart attack. Um, so that just shows how serious it can impact us. Um, I mean, chest pain, short of breath, all of it. And so all of that to say is that if someone's having those symptoms, um, still wise to get checked out and rule out a heart attack, but just know that anxiety um, can affect our bodies that strongly. Um, and that might be something that you've seen before or even perhaps experienced before. Yeah, I'll just add to that too. So when you have um, seen symptoms of anxiety, depression, know that sometimes you will see all four of these in action. You may see three of them in action. Sometimes you may only see one of these boxes. Like maybe you're only gonna see the way our bodies react. I remember um, my daughter lost a classmate when she was in first grade and the symptoms she had of anxiety was she had a stomach ache every day. She was internalizing that, especially if you got people that internalize things and aren't externally sharing them with other people, you may only see how that body is reacting and the anxiety was causing stomach pain for her. And that was a symptom. So just be thoughtful um, of that. There's multiple symptoms you can see. It may be all of these. It may be one of these boxes. <clears throat> I just want to add something else to it. It's really good for you to see these four different ways, because next session, we're going to talk about a strategy about how to manage symptoms of depression and anxiety. And we talk about the stop technique. And what we're doing is trying to change the way we think, because if we change the way we think, it's going to change the way we feel and change the way they act and go easier on our body. So we're going to talk about these four symptoms but how to address them and stop them from spiraling for people in one of our um, self-care strategies that we teach you the next session. So remember this as symptoms, but also remember this as, as a way we are gonna step into some symptoms and help them control those symptoms and prevent them from cycling or maybe extending and getting worse. Um, before we dive into causes, we're just going to really um, quick define uh, these for you. Um, again, this is not something that you need to know or have memorized. We just want you to have kind of a general idea for if it does come up. So in terms of depression, so the diagnosed um, kind of 
phrase for depression, it's called major depressive disorder. Um, so some people you come across may have an official diagnosis of this from their doctor. There are also probably going to be many people you come across that fall into this classification that maybe are undiagnosed. Um, but just to be aware that this is a diagnosis out there and what um, kind of leads to that diagnosis, the criteria um, for a provider to give this diagnosis is um, severe depression, a profoundly depressed mood, which is associated with a significant loss of pleasure, interest in life. Um, it can include feelings of guilt, feeling inadequate, um, and some symptoms with it. They associate, you know, disturbed sleep, weight changes. And, and a huge thing along with this too is um, when someone has difficulty accomplishing daily tasks. So whether that's going to work, um, taking care of their personal hygiene, taking care of their family. Um, so those are all things that kind of factor into then a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Um, anyone who's suicidal too is likely kind of falling into this category. Um, and then along with that, there's also what we call dysthymia. And this is more of a persistent mild depression. Um, it can go, I mean, it might even be for years. And that is characterized by people that are just kind of always sad, down, discouraged. They usually, usually just view everything kind of negatively. Um, so those are kind of two things that you may see. Um, when it comes to anxiety, the diagnosed um, term for anxiety is generalized anxiety disorder. And the criteria for that is extreme worry almost every day for six months or more. Um, so you can see time kind of plays into this for how long something persists for before um, a diagnosis is um, given. Um, and so that extended worry, um, people finding it difficult to control their worry, worry seems more than warranted about events. So someone just expecting the worst for maybe not a very clear reason. Um, again, persistent excessive worry whether it's about money, health, family, work, or other issues, which is kind of a precursor to what we're going to talk about in a second with causes, um, that some people have these causes that might predispose them to excessive worry, which can ultimately lead to this generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so again, just something to kind of be aware of. And then also with anxiety, we just wanted to touch on phobias. So phobias are an extreme or irrational fear of something. So that there's many things out there. So I always joke like agoraphobia is fear of spiders um, and irrational fear of a tiny little insect, which I, I absolutely have. Um, but some other perhaps more um, serious ones in terms of impacting your daily life would be social phobia, which is an extreme fear of situations where you might be judged, embarrassed, humiliated. Um, so kind of being in social situations where you might, um, yeah, you might embarrass yourself, that kind of social fear. And then the second one we wanted to cover is um, agoraphobia, which is an extreme, or I think I said agoraphobia for the spider one. The spider one's arachnophobia. Sorry, <laughs> not to be confused. Agoraphobia <laughs> is extreme or irrational fear of leaving one's home. So being in places where it might be difficult to escape, being in open or crowded places. Um, so for instance, like going to the store or um, just being in crowded public settings. Um, so I do think that we have seen this a little bit more after COVID um, where we were home so much and then now, you know, um, and so, um, you know, during COVID, of course, there was a reason to have that fear. And now that, um, you know, people aren't getting as sick as much, um, it can, it can be um, a little more of an extreme fear for the actual risk involved. Um, so again, just kind of something to be aware of. These are some of the terms you might come across. Um, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I would just say you're going to run into all sorts of situations. <clears throat> A lot of, um, you know, everybody has times of where they just feel depressed for a day or two or, or anxiety for a short period of time. Um, that's things people go through. You may run into someone who's experiencing that and you will work alongside and support them and, and help them give tools to manage it. But all of these that are listed here, like major depressive disorder, dysthymia, generalized anxiety order, the kind of common thread that goes through all these is they last, they're persistent. 
they're like every day or they last for six months or longer. And typically when someone was having is having major depressive disorder or dysthymia or a generalized anxiety disorder, they are going to need, or some of these phobias we talked about, they are going to need some um, extra support. And that's where you might see someone in accessing um, the healthcare system in a little bit more extensive way to get counseling, or they might be using medications or whatever. So just know you are going to run into all these situations. We wanted you to be aware of it. And you don't have to know all the things about this or what's done related to it. We just wanted you to be aware is, is these situations here are ones that are like every day or they last for a long period of, of, of time. And that's when you usually need more support to come alongside you in the healthcare system to um, help someone treat it and manage it. All right, so that brings us to our causes of depression and anxiety. Um, and I think just a good precursor to this is recognizing that um, stress is a part of our life and it's actually a very beneficial and useful part of our life. Um, if we didn't have any stress, we would never go to work. We would never um, you know, make dinner or uh, take care of things at home. Um, so stress has its place. It's just when, um, that stress becomes, again, like she said, persistent, overwhelming, um, extreme, that kind of thing. Um, and so we're going to look at a variety of causes. This is kind of our brief list. Um, and we're going to dive into these individually. Um, so the first one we're going to cover is genetics. So genetics, of course, is what's passed on from our parents. So we get some of our DNA from our dad and from our mom. Um, and so just like we can inherit certain traits, um, depression tends to run in families. So that doesn't mean that if your parent, your grandparent has depression, you will automatically have that. Um, it's not like you, you know, inherit your color eyes, but it does mean that you might have a greater tendency towards that. Um, and studies have actually shown that people with um, depression with their parents or grandparents um, have a, a higher risk of also developing it. Um, same thing with anxiety. Anxiety disorders tend to cluster in families. Um, and there's a lot of overlap, too, with anxiety and depression we see um, in families. Um, so along with that is brain chemicals. So I kind of touched on this a little bit when I talked about that imbalance um, in, your, in your brain. So that's actually... Um, related to brain chemicals. They're called neurotransmitters. There's several different ones. These are just a few examples here. Um, and so when we have this imbalance, it causes symptoms. Um, and it can be either a genetic, tendon or, genetic tendency towards that imbalance, or also stressful or traumatic events, um, or, you know, anxiety for a long time, or stressful events for a long time. Those can actually also cause imbalances in our brain. Um, so some of those situational things can actually have an impact on us biochemically as well. Um, so just a couple ones you see here, um, the dopamine, more adrenaline, um, the GABA and the serotonin, those are a few that um, we see in particular that medications can assist in fixing um, that imbalance. Um, so I'll just give a brief example. Um, you may have heard of a certain medication class. They're called SSRIs, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. So essentially it stops serotonin from disappearing out of um, kind of the brain where we want it to be. Um, and so for an example of that is Zoloft, if that's a familiar medication name you've heard of. And so essentially all it does is it creates more serotonin in the brain and can help to correct that chemical. Um, so just kind of some things to generally be aware of um, that are the, you know, the cause of our depression and anxiety can actually be this imbalance in our brain. Um, something else to just briefly mention too is um, hormonal imbalances can also affect this, especially among females. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard of, you know, postpartum depression and some of those hormonal changes. Um, so hormones can also have a play in this. So that's um, something to add as well. Anything for this slide? Okay. So the next thing um, we want to look at is loss and grief. Um, so we've all experienced losses in our in our lifetimes, whether that's a loss of a loved one, 
of an important relationship, a job, a home, our health, even the loss of our youth. Um, and losses actually um, trigger a really healthy grieving process. And you can see these five stages of grief. So denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So you can see that depression is actually part of the healthy grieving process. The difference is when um, you go through a healthy, healthy grieving process, you move through each of these stages until you get to acceptance. And that might take a long time. It might take weeks. It might take months. It might even take years, depending on what the loss is. Um, but when we get stuck in that depression and we can't get out of that depression, um, that's when, you know, we develop this more um, of a serious depression or even a diagnosable depression. Um, and so you might know someone who perhaps has lost someone. I often think of um, some examples of my life of people that have lost children and it might even have been 10 years and they're just still fighting um, this depression and kind of stuck in this depression from that loss. So definitely a very real serious thing you will um, likely come across. And the other one with that is trauma. Um, and so what um, we kind of want to communicate with trauma. Um, so a couple examples, it might be domestic violence, something in the home, um, rape or sexual abuse. And then also just abuse as children, whether that's physical, emotional um, neglect too. There can be a lot of trauma in childhood as well. And so if you come across this, um, first of all, we want to recognize that people who have survived this are strong and resilient people. Um, with that, they may need additional support. Um, we're not expecting you guys to be um equipped to handle these really complex um, things with trauma, especially when it's something that's happened a long time ago and kind of helping them unpack that, that's likely something that we're going to want to refer them to someone who's trained a professional in that area. Um, and so if, if you have had a similar experience, you might feel um, able to speak into what they're going through. But if it's a trauma that you don't feel comfortable with, that's okay. You can be a great listener and then maybe assist them in getting connected. That might even be your role is just connecting them to a professional resource. Anything to add to that? Okay. Okay, so this is kind of the next section and I like to joke about, but not that funny, that these are the adulthood issues that you learn very quickly um, as soon as you become an adult. So the first one would be economic issues. So that is things like um, unemployment, bills, foreclosure, um, maybe food insecurity. Um, and these are things that can lead to a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness and can make depression and anxiety more likely can kind of trigger it. Um, along with that would be family issues. So whether that's marital problems, being a single parent, um, maybe behavioral problems, maybe a, with a child. So um, just the toll of trying to help a child that's going through a lot. Um, and, or it might be caregiving stress. So you're caring for your kids and you're also caring for aging parents and you're kind of overwhelmed. That one also gets really tricky because that kind of role overload of having so many responsibilities and caring for so many people um, can be hard because they're people you really love and care for, yet it's also causing maybe some anxiety and depression, um, kind of carrying that. Um, and then also physical issues. So um, physical health problems include, you know, pain, disability. There's actually really clear associations between um, depression and pain, and it has kind of a reciprocal effect. So um, depression can worsen pain. Um, so like if you have pain already, depression will likely make your pain worse. And pain can also cause depression. So they really contribute both ways. Um, let me see. Yeah, and then again with that, when it comes to anxiety and um, physical issues as well, um, you might become worried or anxious if you have a physical issue or even um, let's say you have a serious or a chronic illness that you know hopelessness or depression about your future um, might play a role or just that um, that fear of something happening um, related to your chronic illness. So um, definitely you see a lot of mental issues tied to physical issues and physical issues tied to mental issues. So kind of important to be aware of that. 
Um, I think too, these are ones that are going to be very common with men. Um, I think especially just that, um, that feeling responsibility to provide and take care of a family. And so they might be experiencing a lot of stress or feeling overwhelmed um, related to these things. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of reminders. In this role as a mental health ambassador, you are free to connect with anybody, any age, male, female, whatever. You, we, we welcome that. Um, my guess is, though, that hearing from remembering the focus group that we did with men, men really want to talk to other men about this. And so my guess is you'll probably do quite a few um, connections with men. And in that focus group, I remember um, these issues coming up a lot, economic stressors and relationship structures, whether it be within the family or relationships with others. So that came up a lot. And I agree, like Ani said, you will probably be in a situation when you're talking to someone, they may be sharing these stressors and these causes. Because in the focus group, we did hear the lot that these two things are seen by a lot of men as causes of anxiety and depression in their life. Um, so you'll probably be speaking into this quite a bit with men that you are connecting with. And again, just being aware that these are triggers and these are causes. Um, I help helping to kind of identify where it's coming from is going to be really instrumental in helping them um, kind of figure out how to manage it and what um, what areas in particular. Um, all right, just a couple more here. So another one would be cultural issues. Um, just a second. Um, so the first would be separation from family. Um, and kind of like we talked about with loss, separation from family can, can function very similar to a loss and there can be a lot of grieving with that. Um, it can be really difficult around certain times of the year, whether that's holidays or special events, you know, birth of a child, a graduation, that kind of thing. Um, and so just some examples of where these separation of family might be, whether that's um, deportation. Um, and I think of, you know, the anxiety of um, being undocumented and that being a part of um, someone's reality. Um, and then also things like incarceration, whether um, that's a parent or a child um, and kind of dealing with that. Um, another cultural issue is uh racism and discrimination. Um, and that I think we know has just such an impact on um, how we feel. It can lead to feelings of anger, sense of not belonging, feeling of not being accepted. Um, and th th those are just very real things that can trigger anxiety and depression. We understand that these are, these are really sensitive topics and difficult topics. Um, but just definitely feel it's important to recognize how these play into these situations as well. Anything to add on that? No, I will say, um, as Ani said, these were other causes that we heard in the focus groups that we did with men, the impact of dis discrimination and the impact of um, being separated from lo loved ones in immigration, you know, where some family members are here and some are not. And those are very real issues and causes that can cause anxiety and depression. And uh, we will hear them when we're out in the community talking to people. So just to be aware of that um, factor and cause is important. And then the last couple here we're gonna cover, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the ones we felt have been highlighted and are maybe more common ones, things that you will come across. Um, so another one, neighborhood issues. Um, whether that's just the general decline of a neighborhood, lack of recreation areas. Um, so for instance, you know, we'll talk about things like getting outside and walking, but for some people, um, this might factor into them, you know, not feeling comfortable doing that. Um, could be gang activity, safety issues. These are all things that lead people to feeling isolated. Um, maybe they feel like they need to stay in their homes, mind their own business, and it can literally become depressing to be in that neighborhood. Um, and on the flip side, a neighborhood can be a real source of social support as well. 
Um, sorry. Soak <laughs> up from her nap. Okay. And then the last one is weather. So this is the one that we are very familiar with living in Michigan. Um, there's actually a diagnosis, seasonal affective disorder, that is for people that experience um, kind of these depressive, um, they're really down during the winter months when they're not getting as much um, vitamin D, as much sunshine. sunshine. And so just recognizing too, um, weather can be, is a legitimate cause and trigger of depression. Um, do we want to go through these? Do you want to go through these, um, scenarios? Okay. So I will, how about I present, um, oops, I'll present the scenario and then, um, if you would be willing to kind of give some ideas and speak into it. Okay, so um, here's an example of something you might come across. So your friend Jonathan is working multiple jobs but struggling to stay on top of his bills. He tells you he doesn't know how he's going to pay rent this month. Jonathan says it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. He seems discouraged and hopeless. So what could you as an ambassador do to make him feel heard, to, um, to be, you know, what would be some, some things you could maybe communicate in this situation? So I think some of the first things that's important to communicate is you're, you're actively listening to him. And remember, those are things to say like open-ended questions. Tell me more about how you've been feeling lately. And that allows this person to expand on that. So sometimes remember, just talking and having someone listen is a very therapeutic thing for another person. So use those kind of open-ended questions. Tell me more about how you've been feeling lately. Remember to use those nonverbals that really demonstrate your listening. Put your cell phone away, lean in, you can nod, you know, show them, give them eye contact, show them that you're really listening and ask clarifying questions when you need to. So do I understand you correctly? And then again, allows them to clarify if they're processing um, what they're talking about. You could also use a strategy by sharing something you are learning in class. Maybe the person you're talking to knows that you're an ambassador and you're working in this area about promoting mental health. You could always say something, I've been learning in class that there's four different symptoms associated with anxiety and with depression, how we feel, how we act, how we think, and how our bodies respond. It sounds like you've been feeling sad or unmotivated lately, and it's making you have a hard time get out of bed. So you just showed that this these feelings can affect how you think and how you act, and those go together. So just... Um, helping people understand the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety can be incredibly valuable to people as they're thinking about how to manage them or what they mean. And then you could use um, teach them a strategy. And in the next session, we're going to give you some real practical day-to-day -day things you can encourage people to do to manage depression and anxiety or prevent it in their life. So you could go on with this person and share some of the things you've learned, some self-care strategies that they could use. And then remember to encourage them um, and applaud them for their strength it took to share this with you. Like, thank you so much for sharing this story with me. It takes a lot of strength to share how you're feeling um, and, and reminding them that I just want to let you know, I won't be sharing what we talked about with anyone else. And that assures them about that confidentiality. So again, those are some real practical things that you can do in your role. Show them you're actively listening. Um, you can share what you've been learning about what signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety are. You can share some strategies that you have used that you've found to be helpful and, and see if they sound like they would be helpful to them. And again, end with reminding them that you're so grateful they shared their story with you. It takes a lot of strength to say or share it. And I'll make sure to keep this um, confidential. I won't share this with others. One thing um, an ambassador um, shared with us as an idea, too, is, you know, if you're hearing someone and you're really recognizing that, um, you know, kind of his his stress over his bills is what is a huge cause and trigger of these symptoms he's seen, um, even partnering with him and brainstorming, you know, um, 
yeah, what do, what are some things you can do to help with this, whether it's helping to find a resource or um, just encouraging them in that. So um, yeah, for I mean, first of all, like the listening is so important, but if you feel like it's really attributed to one cause, helping them, you know, talk about that and, and process and maybe brainstorm a little bit um, can be useful in that situation as well. With that said, though, not all things are in our control. And so um, be mindful of if um, if it's a situational thing that can change or if it's a situational thing that can't change, because um, then the approach will be different. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, right. I mean, some things we can change and then you're going to try to empower people to do what they can to change that. But other things can't be changed. Um, like the daily stress of finances sometimes is just going to be there. So then it's more like, what are strategies we can put in place that helps us manage that stress better? So you will have a different approach um, with, with whether it's changeable or not changeable. And then one more scenario example we had. So um, Eric, your coworker tells you that when he needs to go to the store mm -hmm. or be in crowded places, he becomes nauseated and his heart starts to race he then tells you he wishes he could just snap out of it so again same thing you want to always start out with those conversations with demonstrating active listening techniques so things like open-ended questions tell me more about how you're feeling at the store learn a little bit more about it tell me more about what you think's causing it that may help you get at some of the cause use those nonverbals that show you're listening again eye contact, don't have distractions in the way, really um, lean in, let them know you're listening and ask clarifying questions when you need to. You can also help him identify this again as potentially symptoms of anxiety or stress that, that he is experiencing. Um, and again, that whole thing we talked about, one of the stigmas associated with anxiety and depression is you should just snap out of it. So you may want to just say something like, uh, anxiety is caused by a variety of things and it can't always be just snapped out of it. So just affirming them that it's not so easy all the time to just snap out of it. Sometimes we have to implement some life practices or some self-care strategies regularly to manage it. So giving them space to say, you know what, it's not easy to snap out of, but there's things we can do. And then give some hope that there's things that we can do every day in our life that will help us to manage it. Um, and then again, we'll give you some techniques you can share with them that will be in the next session. What are real practical things you can share? And then end with, as we did last time, thank you so much for sharing this. It takes a lot of strength to share it with someone that you're struggling. And please know I'll not share this other information with other people or what we talked about today. All right, so that brings us to the end of the second session. Um, kind of a lot of content, but again, um, this is just to help, um, yeah, provide just a basis so you, you feel e equipped going in. Um, you feel like you can identify some symptoms and um, identify some triggers or causes, um, and we'll just get help you have that awareness in these conversations you will be having. Yeah, and session three, which we will end this one now, and we'll we'll start that recording next, will be about those self-care and coping strategies um, you can practice in your own life, but even more importantly in this role, help to share it with other people that you'll be talking with to help them prevent depression, anxiety, or help to manage it. So that'll be session three. See you soon.